Joining me in studio live is uh, King George VI himself, Jared Harris, here in Studio <laughs> Q. Hi, Jared. <laughs> thank you. How are you? Good, good. Yeah, good, thank you. You've, you've done a lot of different roles over your career. Uh, people listening to this might know you from Mad Men, um, as Lane Price, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, and Lincoln, Moriarty in the Sherlock films. Um, I actually don't have time to read the whole resume or we'd be off the air. Uh, but what was it about this particular role in The Crown, uh, King George VI, that, that really attracted you? The scripts initially, and it always starts with that, and uh, it, it was a wonderfully well-written uh, script that quite often what happens with scripts is they design the the narrative so that you're following a, sp a central character and all the other characters are really just sort of figments of that character's story and they, they just reinforce that story. But really good writing each character has their own unique point of view, and uh, which is independent of, of whatever the, uh, the the narrative is, and that they are allowed to. Uh, it's justified from that character's point of view. So this was written like that, and I Im immediately recognised that. Uh, I was fascinated by the the. This is coming at a point of this person's life that um, was, hadn't been dealt with before. And he had a, sort of a, a, a wit and a warmth about him and a vulnerability. And I, um, I also love the idea of, of working with Stephen Daldry, whose work I admire very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think at that point, uh, the Claire was on board and John Lithgow was on board and Matt was on board. So, you know, really good company. So when you, when you say this is a part of uh, the character that hasn't been dealt with before, I think it had this been like 10 years ago, I probably wouldn't know too much about the king at all. You know, in Canada, we're, of course, we're familiar with the, the queen, Queen Elizabeth II, yes. but, her, but her father um, is, is, is not, well, people of my generation maybe are not as familiar with him. Um, until so, the king's speech came uh, out. Uh, so that's the thing, until yeah. the king's speech came out. Yeah. So all of a sudden, there's, there's people know about him. Colin Firth mm. uh, uh, play, plays uh, King George VI in that film. Did, the, did that factor into you at all? Was that intimidating at all? Well... It was only intimidating every day because uh, when w I would walk to the set, there was this giant poster of the King's Speech with a 30-foot life-size figure Did they put it up of just Colin to... Firth that I would have to walk underneath on my way to the, to the set each day. So uh, thank you. But actually, I, I ended up, it ended up being a source of comfort for me because um, when you start digging into the research, of course, it becomes really obvious I'd look nothing like him. And... I, there was no way I could look anything like him. I was just not, I not see, started to put on tons of prosthetics. And then I thought, well, you know, Colin didn't look anything like him either, and it didn't hurt his performance. So I'm not going to worry about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Netflix, Netflix does the research. I'm sure, I know they don't, they don't disclose the budget to you or anything like that. But well, they disclose the budget right in the very beginning. But, they, but, the, 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 but the, the point about the thing about the budget is this is, a, this is an epic uh, it's an epic story. Yeah. It takes place over continents, you know. And if you're not going to commit fully to that, there's just no point taking it on. That, you know, that it's a story that takes place within a family that has all this grandeur and glamour, yeah. even though there's an interesting side note to that, which is parts of Buckingham Palace were falling apart and it was infested with rats. And But at the same time, there is this public display of the uh, of of the the crown that's important to maintaining that status. So you have to commit to those things, and that's going to cost money to do. I guess it's not the it's not the budget that I'm interested in, but it's more like the why. Like I'm sure Netflix does does the research, but this isn't a, a UK only show. This isn't a, a Canada only mm. show. This this is a show that will be uh, uh, going around the world. Why do you think audiences, no matter where they are, are interested in in this royal family? That's a very good question, and I factored into their decision to do this because, as Andy Harry's told me this, and he said that there's this fascination. There is this fascination with it. They discovered that on doing uh, the Queen and then doing the audience, and um, and why is that? Peter Morgan says it's because, on the one hand, we 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 think these people have everything. They have the perfect lives, and that and there's a sort of fascination that when we, you look into it and you realize is that they, they can't make choices that we can make in our lives every day. They're in a prison, in a sense. And, and that in a, makes us feel better about our own lives, you know. Mm -hmm. and I, I, everyone has imagined what would it be like to be, would it be good to be king? Yeah. Um, but then you look at this and you go, <laughs> 
I think I've, I've, I'm better off in a lot of ways because yeah. you're free to you're free to be with whoever you want to be with. You can marry whoever you want to marry. You you can say whatever you want to say. You can actually exercise control over your life rather than have to ask permission from the political leaders. Am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to say that? You're going to go to this country next week and you're going to promote some trade deal or whatever. You're 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 not your own person. So. Well, was, it, was it interesting to you when you first came to America? And I know the producer of this segment, Ben Edwards, out there, Ben's from Cornwall, and he even said, and he came to uh, Canada a few years ago, and he said... Hey, you know, people from Cornwall do not consider themselves to be English. You do know that, though. No, no, yes, that's true. Yeah. Ben Ben says yes. Ben <laughs> arms yeah. up. He says yes. absolutely yes. yes. Yeah, he's Cornish. <laughs> yeah. So our cor- not totally even, different. Our yeah. Cornish <laughs> producer Ben Edwards <laughs> said that he was even a bit surprised when he came here how how interested people were in the roles. Was that with the Royals? Were people uh, was was that a shock to you when you first moved to America? Uh, so I, in a way, because they're sort of they're more interested than they are in England. They, they, in England, it, it's a it's a contentious issue because. You'll, you could you can get into a pub fight over should we get rid of them or not, you know, whereas over here you're not going to get into a pub fight. It's yet. more contentious in the UK. Yeah, I yeah. think it is. Yeah. It's, the, it's still something that's debated is why do we have, should we be paying for this and what, what good do they serve? And and that's one of the challenges that, they, that each generation of the royal family have, which is how do you maintain your relevance to the country? And that's something they think about a lot. And it's one of the things that we discussed in yeah. uh, in the rehearsals was what is the job? You know, what is the job of being the monarch? How do you know you did a good job? You know, when you go to bed at the end of the night and you want to pat yourself on the back, how do you know if you did a good <laughs> job? Because there's, did, no, there's no job description. Where did you land on there? It's literally what you want to make of it. And that's why Edward wouldn't have been a good king because um, uh, he, he saw it. Interestingly, they both saw it as a burden. Yeah, this is, um, this is uh, sorry, I should say, this, this is, is George, who, George VI's brother. Yeah, who abdicated. Uh, who abdicated the yes. throne, yeah. Um, they both saw it as a burden. He was into the sort of, more into the kind of the privilege and the frippery of it. Whereas the whereas Albert, who became George VI, he saw it as a responsibility and a duty. And, and really it was, it, almost it was his experience during the Second World War that defined what the job was for him. And that was that he had to be a sort of source of, uh, you know, of, of morale boosting for his country. And, and um, one of the things that they decided to do, for example, was they weren't going to leave London whilst um, the war was going on and while the Blitz was going on. They were going to live with exactly the same rationing and exactly the same conditions in terms of the, the, uh, the, their electricity and water supply and stuff like that um, so that they, they had no... It, would, it was no different for them than for anybody else. And when Roosevelt visited during the war he comes to visit the Buckingham Palace Eleanor Roosevelt wrote this letter back to her friends of hers back in the US and she was shocked at the conditions that they were living in you know the, the sort of the, the the meager portions of food that were available there was a line in the bathtub and you couldn't fill your bathtub above oh, really? that yeah. yeah and this was in this was in Buckingham Palace this yeah. was in this was in the palace yeah the palace was peeling there are mice running around. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jared, Jared Harris, I'm talking to you today about your new Netflix series, uh, The Crown. And one of the main storylines of the series is a young Princess Elizabeth mm-hmm. having to fit into the shoes of her father, become a beloved monarch. And, of course, I'm wondering about this theme for you. Your father is a very famous actor, oh, sure. Richard Harris. Uh, many listeners listening to this right now might know him as King Arthur in the classic Camelot. Another demographic might remember him as the first Dumbledore in Harry Potter. Did you relate, or MacArthur Park? Did sure. you did you relate to the uh, then Princess Elizabeth about having to follow in the footsteps of such a well known father? Uh, not really. <laughs> no, because he wasn't. He wasn't the king. No, uh, but there must have been some pressure growing up. Not no. There was no pressure. I mean, pressure to do what? I mean, that's that's the interesting. I I unlike um, her, I could choose what I wanted to do. She couldn't. Right. And right. Right. Um, and that was again one of the things that that her father was upset, was desperately upset with his brother about, was he knew what what that would mean for his his children and for his daughter. He didn't want this to come her way. He wanted her to have a normal life. But when you, when you did choose though, when yes. you did say, okay, well, I'm, oh, I'm when you do act. choose, yeah. yes, then uh, of course. I mean, it, there's there's a. Uh, you know, it's a shadow and you have to figure out how you're going to establish yourself and 
get out of the shadow. But at the same time, you know, I, I I knew a lot about the business from observing him and from talking to him and from seeing how he would interact with it and learnt a lot, you know. So, uh, and he was a, a source of inspiration. You know, he my father came from very he 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 came from a, a middle class family in Limerick that had really very little interest in the arts. So for him to have clawed his way out of there and become successful was incredible, uh, an achievement, an act of determination and will, mm -hmm. you know, and I am, I had a I'm beneficiary of that. So, yeah. and, and, and when you made that but he decision. couldn't open any doors for me or anything like that. It wasn't like he could, he, you, you, that doesn't happen in the business because everybody's in the, in this business, as I'm sure it is in yours, every decision that somebody makes can get them fired. Right. So uh, no one is going to give you a job um, as a favor to somebody else because if you mess that job up, then that's your head on the chopping block as well as the person that you've given the favor to. So, but but I got to guess that the pressure's not. I, mean, I know the pressure is an interesting word, but like when you went to America to to study drama, sure. you, you studied acting in America. Was, was, was that I, I went to no, it was at Central School in London. But you, you went to America as well, right? You College. Went to, I went to did, Duke University. Yeah. Oh, for university. Yeah. yeah for university. Yeah. Did you? You know, did you did it feel different over here or, or over in in America because your father was this very esteemed actor in Britain? It, there, there's there's a chance that when you went to America, people weren't well. It, there's a different attitude uh, in England and to America. And in England, um, the the attitude is sort of more in a slightly embarrassed one, which is, oh God, he's probably not going to be awful and. You know, it's going to be really embarrassing. And um, who's who's this? This, this, is, this is people thinking about you want to go and follow in your father's footsteps. Oh, into right, the business. yeah, it's probably not going to work a sort out. Of desperate lack of imagination. And yeah, you really, you know. <laughs> whereas in America, they think, well, maybe you know, who knows? Maybe lightning strikes twice. Let's have a look. Whereas over there, it's like, oh, you know, they. Uh, it's a difference of, and it's you know, I the, the other difference of attitude is, in England, there's the attitude is, well. For example, it's uh, uh, you. You want to do something that nobody's done before, and in England they'll go, "Oh well, gosh, <laughs> you, might, they, you they, might not want to. You might want to rethink uh, that. Nobody's done that before." <laughs> Whereas in America they go, "Hey, no one's done that before. Let's give it a shot." <laughs> Right on, right on. So um, we don't have much time left with you. We're, we're really? Gonna, we're, yeah, we're gonna. We got about. A, we got about a minute left. You're, 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 you're going on to a million other interviews to, to, to talk about this thing. I, I do appreciate. Here you. comes the killer question. Oh no, I have nothing. Oh okay. no, it's all, no, no, no. We're gonna we're gonna close really? it up right now. Oh. I, have, I don't have no. So so why did you? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. Exactly. I don't have anything like that. But I, maybe if the question that I, I'm trying to think of the killer question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, like, I, I think after what you said about your father and and you said something earlier that I'm really interested in. I don't. I hope we have time for it. We just said, you know, my, my father gave me advice. I, I learned a lot from my father. And I, I, I think it, it must be advantageous. It must be so so nice to know that you're following in the footsteps of your father, no matter what the what, what he did. You know, if your if your father was a teacher and and you were a teacher, right? You, 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 it'd be great to follow in those footsteps. I, I, that's one of the things I I've been asked this question a lot. And I, you know, our parents are mythical figures to us, no matter you know? what they do. Yes, and whether your father, he's a, he was a teacher, your mother was a teacher, or a police officer or whatever, they are mythical figures. And, and if you, you want to go and follow into those footsteps, it's the same thing. It's just that more people know about who that person is if they were a singer or a film actor or something like that. So what did you learn from him? What did you learn from him? Well, what I learned was... <laughs> <laughs> uh, down, we don't have time. Uh, what I learned was... It's sort of specific things. I mean, um, he... Gosh, I watched how he he dealt with the business side of it. Um, um, in terms of the he handled he, how he handled his career rather than allowing other people to handle it or other people to make choices for him. Um, he he was an incredibly determined person. I mean, you know, for okay, quick story. He. Uh, when Richard Burton just t said he didn't want to play King Arthur in Camelot, there was this huge scramble about who was going to play King Arthur in Camelot. Yeah. And um, Lawrence Harvey had played it in London, so the assumption was it would probably be Lawrence, but it might be somebody else. I found all these telegrams after he died, and he sent to Jack Warner saying, um, Vanessa Redgrave, six foot one, Richard Burton, five foot seven, Richard Harris, six foot four. 
you know, I'd be much better for this part. And he was campaigning quite heavily for it. And, um, and they weren't interested in him for it. And he, he finds out that the director is going to a party in Palm Springs. So he goes down to Palm Springs and he finds someone who's working the party, who's the same size of him as he is, pays him money to swap clothes. <laughs> no way. Goes carrying food around the table. Like, yeah, like, like a working, waiter. Yeah, working yes. in the... Yeah. yeah, at the party. And the conversation is, who's <laughs> going to play King Arthur? And he says, well, there's only one person for all, that's Richard Harris. And the director looks up and sees it's him. He goes, God, would you ever leave me alone? You'd be bugging me. And he says, I will if you'll give me an audition. And he says, is that all it will take? He says, yes, I'm not asking you to give me the role. I just want an audition. He went, if I say yes, will you go away? He says, I will. And he said, OK, I'll give you an audition. That's, a, that's an incredible story. Jared Harris, thanks so much for coming in. That was actor Jared Harris. He plays King George VI. He didn't have to impersonate a waiter to, to do it either in the new Netflix show, I The Crown. Know. Uh, no, you know, well, that's to be con- uh, the next interview. <laughs> the new series premieres on Netflix next Friday, November 4th. Jared Harris joined me live right here in Studio Q.